you can never perfect what we do. There, there is no way, I've never met anyone who goes, that's perfection. I'm not a typical beauty, so basically, I've got a long neck and a long face. That's usually period. That's usually some kind of inbreeding weirdness. Immediately when he came on set, it was on. And like everyone just was on their A game at all times. Hello, Believe Nation, it's Evan. My one word is believe, and I believe in people more than they believe in themselves. And my sincere hope is that if you see in yourself what I see in you, you'll be able to change the planet. So to help you on your journey, today we're gonna learn from actor Benedict Cumberbatch and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Rule number two is my personal favorite, and I'd love to know which one you guys like the best. Also, as you're watching, if you hear something that really resonates with you, please leave it down in the comments below and put quotes around it so other people can be inspired by it as well. And if you leave it within the first couple hours of this video going live, you have a chance to win one of two daily prizes. You can never perfect what we do. There, there is no way, I've never met anyone who goes, that's perfection. I mean, to an audience outside of your work, people can think that that's the only way they'd ever want to see that part played or that moment done, whatever. But as an actor, and this isn't mock humility, I think it's just it just goes for all art forms, really. The, the whole point is perfection is unachievable. So it's that constant pursuit of the unobtainable, which is kind of magic, really, you know, and, and, um, and should keep us kind of motivated to try better. You know, it's the Beckett thing, you know, fail again, fail better. There isn't a better actor, certainly for this role, but perhaps period, uh, than, than Benedict Cumberbatch, who was remarkable to work with. Enjoy these final moments of peace. Immediately when he came on set, it was on. And like everyone just was on their A game at all times. Like no one was slacking because it was, there was something about Benedict's, you know, focus and, and his presence that uh, really just helped challenge everyone to do the best possible job. It was awesome. I am better. What? Everything. You fully commit to every role that you play. Yeah. So I was thinking, when you do fully commit to a role, what are the sacrifices you have to make to fully commit to it up, up to a part like this? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, a lot. I think, I think specifically when you're working, um, you have to... Wow, that's such a good question. That's such a good question. Sorry. So no, well, I mean, logistically, obviously, just the business of acting, the fact that you're doing certain hours and sometimes you're working all night and doing weird antisocial days at weekends, you, you'll, you'll forget about your social life. That, that, that's a sort of sacrifice to commitment. Um, it's nothing quite on the level that Julian uh, sacrifices, but you don't get to see your family, you don't get to see your friends, you are removed from you, the reality of your life to pursue a, a given goal, so there is a kind of comparison. Um, I guess you you sacrifice a part of yourself because you're exposing either either end of the spectrums of acting, whether it's just variations of who you are or whether it's completely dissembling into a different character and persona. Equally valid in my opinion. I don't think there's really a distinction to draw other than people who are good or bad at it. But um, I think then you do have to uh, give part of yourself no matter what you're doing. And that you, you don't lose, you sometimes gain actually by doing that, but you have to suppress and control certain instincts that you have in order to actually be true to a character that may not be the same as you, right. or be driven by the same things as you. You were offered a, an opportunity to go to Broadway with a play that you'd already been a part of and made a very, it was a very difficult decision for you, but you elected not to do that because of sort of an idea of where you wanted to take things. So It was a very selfish decision as well because it affected a lot of other people. I did do it eight months before we were supposed to go, but um, apologies to Nancy Carroll and Adrian Scarborough and Thea Sharik. I just wanted to mix it up all the time. I really wanted, I wanted to, I, I mean, my theatre training at Lambda was, was a classical theatre, classical English theatre one-year course and a postgraduate course, um, which I really enjoyed and got a lot out of. But, you know, it was, that was it. That was the main focus because I thought, a little bit old-fashioned in my kind of understanding of it. I thought that what I do, what the great actors that had been ahead of me had done and inspired me to do was the idea of starting out in the classics, then maybe a modern play or two, then a few roles in television, and then you know getting a film role, but keep going back to theatre. And that, that is what I've done. That is kind of what I've tried to do. Um, 
the unhappy accident of that play being such a huge success was it came at a point where I thought, Christ, I've actually got some momentum in a medium where it's much more of a closed door. There's a very little uh, long-term memory. It's much more immediate. Your currency is something you really have to kind of work on in film um, quite fast to a, to a degree. I'm saying this in contradiction. Everything I say tonight is contradictory, but I know that. But it's just, <laughs> I guess that's what a personal conversation is, really. It's just a point of view. But... Um, I, um, every time I say anything, I'm thinking, yeah, but the opposite is also very true. <laughs> um, that's the kind of, yeah, that's my head. You're getting into my head. Um, it's great being me. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I, um, I really, I was really lucky to have just had a few breaks, obviously with Sherlock, but also with Tinker Taylor, also with uh, Frankenstein and being cast in uh, War Horse. And that all came at the same kind of point where we were supposed to be coming here to do this Broadway production of After the Dance which might still happen, it might be a film, we don't know. It might, it's some, there might be some life left in it. It was a wonderful experience in London. But I felt that I'd had that experience there and selfishly I wanted to make some capital out of this momentum that was building and I, I'm glad I did because I got Star Trek right. and 12 Years a Slave and August Osage County and um, yeah, it, wor it worked out well for me. But, um, and, and, and The Fifth Estate. So I, I kind of, um, I was very, uh, yeah, I took a gamble and it paid off. I'm really glad you didn't leave college. And I really am. I mean, I, I really enjoyed my further education. I made some of my, my greatest lifelong friends in those moments and had some fantastic experiences. And we all really worked incredibly hard on the productions we put on. So in a way, it was like my, my version of theatre rep, which yeah, was exactly. the old system in England, which I'm sure you know. But, you know, it's this... Um, very arduous, very difficult weekly rep system where you'd be doing a show, you'd be rehearsing one and you'd be sort of getting ready to stage the other. I mean, three different characters and, and uh, three different worlds and involvements and those. It was a great stretch and training for, for actors in the old days. So um, my schedule at the moment is a little bit like that, but also, you know, I, I think we all experienced that in my group at university. We put on a ridiculous amount of plays, sort of what three a time. What drives me is having a challenge and meeting that challenge in a way that'll hopefully make my peers, my family and my friends proud. Part of it is a thrill seeking as well, although I think you're in a lot of danger if you just become an adrenaline junkie, but you need stability, you need stamina and you need to be able to keep your perspective and feel grounded and secure in what you're doing as an actor. Why is there a man in that torpedo? There are men and women in all those torpedoes, Captain. I put them there. Who the hell are you? A remnant of the time long past. Genetically engineered to be superior so as to lead others to peace in a world at war. But we were condemned as criminals, forced into exile. For centuries we slept, hoping when we awoke things would be different. But as a result of the destruction of Vulcan, your Starfleet began to aggressively search distant quadrants of space. My ship was found adrift. I alone was revived. I looked up John Harrison. Until a year ago, he didn't exist. John Harrison was a fiction created the moment I was awoken by your Admiral Marcus to help him advance his cause. A smokescreen to conceal my true identity. My name is Khan. Why would a Starfleet Admiral ask a 300-year-old frozen man for help? Because I am better. At what? Everything. Alexander Marcus needed to respond to an uncivilized threat in a civilized time. After that, he needed a warrior's mind my mind to design weapons and warships. You are suggesting the Admiral violated every regulation he vowed to uphold simply because he wanted to exploit your intellect. He wanted to exploit my savagery. Intellect alone is useless in a fight, Mr. Spock. You, you can't even break a rule. How would you be expected to break bone? Marcus used me to design weapons to help him realize his vision of a militarized Starfleet. He sent you to use those weapons to fire my torpedoes on an unsuspecting planet. And then he purposely crippled your ship in enemy space, leading to one inevitable outcome. The Klingons would come searching for whomever was responsible and you would have no chance of escape. 
Marcus would finally have the war he talked about, the war he always wanted. No, no. I watched you open fire in a room full of unarmed Starfleet officers. You killed them in cold blood. Marcus took my crew from me. You are a murderer. He used my friends to control me. I tried to smuggle them to safety by concealing them in the very weapons I had designed. But I was discovered. I had no choice but to escape alone. And when I did, I had every reason to suspect that Marcus had killed every single one of the people I hold most dear. So I responded in kind. My crew is my family, Kirk. Is there anything you would not do for your family? Proximity alert, sir. There's a ship at warp heading right for us. Klingons? At warp? No, Kirk. We both know who it is. I don't think so. It's not coming at us from Kronos. There are certain, obviously, recurring things that you say, but also that, that interviewers or profilers would say. And one of the things, in terms of a, a complimentary adjective, is that they, there's sort of a sense that you're timeless. There's something about you. You could have just as easily been dropped into a movie with Trevor Howard or, you know, Peter O'Toole or somebody as, as you are today. And the blessing of having a weird face. Oh, weird. <laughs> Somewhere between an otter and something that people find vaguely attractive. <laughs> Or just an otter, which is vaguely attractive. Which is right, that's right. Um, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, you know, on these hottie lists, I just kind of go, well, it doesn't make any sense because I was nowhere near the thousandth hottest face uh, when I started out. So I know it's, I know a lot of it's projection, which is, which is kind of flattering about the work, I suppose. But what I'm saying all that for is, it, you know, I, I started out and I went, yeah, no, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a typical beauty. So basically, I've got a long neck and a long face. That's usually period. That's usually some kind of inbreeding weirdness. <laughs> So uh, I'll run with that. I'll wear some high collars and get on a horse or two. I'm fine with that, but not all the time. Not all the not time. Not all the time. Sometimes I'll just get a collar in a 21st century drama and turn it up, <laughs> as you'll notice I did in Sherlock. So uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I kind of, um, the, uh, the other world, I mean, I had a, a, a great, great English teacher called Martin Tyrrell, Oscar, you remember him? And uh, he said, um, it's weird, you remind me of William Blake. And I went, what? Uh, the um, hallucinating visionary poet of the Romantic era. He went, yeah, well, no, it's just you're quite an old soul. And I went, oh, I kind of, I kind of like that. And I, it kind of, an old soul. Did someone say what? As in, not a, n a new soul, an old soul, old smelly leather soul. And uh, I kind of, I kind of ran with that because um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in England, and you're surrounded by your heritage. Then it's a very deep very long, very kind of old heritage. I mean, not my heritage, but like the heritage of the land and the culture. And I went to school where there were buildings that were 400 years old and those were the new ones, you know. Um, <laughs> it was kind of inspiring. And it meant that whatever I was doing in my context, in my time, I could always see what the past had evolved into and realize that we're not all that far away from that. We really aren't. And we, you know, it's important to be able to recognize it and to be able to honor it and, uh, and learn from it as well. You've got an incredible fan base for your work in Sherlock. Yeah. And working on Star Trek obviously opens you to an even bigger one. Yeah. Did it intimidate you to work in a film franchise with such a rich history, high expectations, and a focal fan base? Oh, that's a good question. Um, y yes and no, but on, you know, basically, the first film, JJ's first outing with Star Trek in 2009, made me realize that the franchise was in very safe hands and that. To be honest, he's such an extraordinary filmmaker and human being. If I was pleasing his idea of what he wanted my character to be within our version of Trek, mm -hmm. Trekdom, then um, that was the only um, concern or preoccupation I had to have with expectations. Because otherwise, that way madness lies. You're never going to be everyone's meet. Someone's going to be throwing up in the corner going, this guy is horrendous. <laughs> and, I, and that's fine. That's allowed. That's what the world's about. But, um, you know, I, 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 I'm very aware, of course, of how possessive and rightfully so Trekkies are. You know, there's a there's a huge deal of respect I have for them because 
it's not just a name for a group of fans mm. it's actually about a level of knowledge and understanding of the subject matter but it's a strange thing because it actually then takes ownership of what it is which originally was a creative process yeah. and received by them as an audience and now the audience has sort of taken control of it so there's good and bad with that there's knowledge which i completely bow to and uh would love to you know immerse myself in and have done since doing the film um so yeah, I, I think I, I was my, my fears, which were rightfully there, obviously, um, because of their kind of presence. Um, although I have to say, a lot of them are incredibly benevolent. I mean, however vocal they may be about what they like or don't like, it, it's it, their opinions. They're not they're not going to kill me. I hope. But you know, it's just <laughs> it's like, they're normal human beings who just have a real enjoyment of quite a quite exceptionally rich, um, you know, materially rich uh, genre um, and 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 cult that is Star Trek. Want to see how many imitations you can do? Put 60 seconds on the clock. The imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch. John Malkovich. Well, I don't know that I. Uh, Alan Rickman. Uh, dying to see it. Can't wait. Sean Connery. Oh, it's a very good film. I think he'll be a phenomenal. I think I'm very excited to see what young Benedict does. Jack Nicholson. Why can we all see the imitation game? <laughs> Tom Hiddleston. Yeah. Yeah, I think you've got to go and see the imitation game. It's going to be great. Owen Wilson? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, it's kind of interesting. I don't... 30 Ooh. seconds left. Michael Caine? I want to see the imitation game. <laughs> don't you? Christopher Walken? I want to see the... Oh, my God. I've got, I've got Jamaican or something. 15 seconds left. Well, <laughs> can you do Bane? I want to see the imitation game. <laughs> McConaughey? Five seconds left. Uh, can you do Taylor Swift? Um, I want to see the imitation game. Uh, <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Christopher Walker for me. I was like, how? What? Uh, yeah. You see this film? I want to see this film. This film's been up my ass. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. I made this video because Sedent Tripathi asked me to. If there's someone you'd like me to profile in their future top 10, please check out the link down in the description below and you can cast your vote on who we should do next. I also want to give a quick shout out to Devon. Thank you so much for picking up a copy of my book, Your One Word, and posting it on Instagram with all those other books that you have on your to read list. Hopefully you'll put Your One Word at the front of that to read list and let me know what you think about it. I hope it has a big impact. And again, thank you for the support. Thank you guys again for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love. I'll see you soon. Is there ever any pressure? Because I imagine the, uh, the budget on this film is not small. Do you ever mess up and you're like, oh God, this is a bit embarrassing. I should have done you, that first. You time. have to treat it like you have to treat it like most other jobs. You really do. Otherwise, yeah, that would get you very much so. But uh -huh. you just have to, you, you're facilitated all the way as well. So uh, for me, anyway, I, I find that a real privilege. What makes me uh, such a big fan of yours is the fact that you seem to completely disappear in the roles, in the characters you play. No matter oh, if it's Sherlock much. or Julian Assange or whoever you play, we don't see you anymore. Thank you. Is it something you would say that one could learn or is that something... I don't know, I don't want to say God-given gift or something, which you just have to have. Oh, I think you could, no, I think you could definitely learn that. I mean, some of it you, you start to have to feel, but even that sort of intuitional, um, emotional kind of feeling, you can, you can learn that by practice. I think you know when something's working, you know. Um, and the rest of it, yeah, no, absolutely. I'd never say that this was some kind of uh, exclusive gift for I think you know it's rather like saying that I, I do believe that everyone has a, a painter or a drawer and them or a musician as well as something as I mean all of us role play all of us sort of disappear to a varying degree in different forms of our lives you know whether it's the private or public face that we have and uh, yeah I think that makes us all capable of being actors I don't think it's the exclusive preserve of those of us lucky enough to call it a living you know is there like pressure when you're doing a superhero and and such a loved superhero? And do you do you like a, 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 is it an immediate yes or do you like call anyone and do you, do you ask like your friends and family like can I be well this I, guy? completely because and I, I know people that know this world and also this particular character far better than me said yes you can and it's it's a fantastic character yeah. you, sh you you should relish it because there's loads of challenges that you'll enjoy within the kind of story and especially if it's an origin story and also Scott Derrickson the director and Kevin Feige the papa 
you know, real sorcerer supreme of Marvel Studios. He, they do the heavy lifting when it comes to what that world is about, yeah. the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And there's nothing they don't know about the comics. There's nothing that they haven't seen as well. So they're the first people to get bored as well as to reference what should be there and what right. shouldn't be there. So I kind of let them guide me, yeah.